You're listening to a book with legs, a podcast presented by Smead Capital Management. At Smead Capital Management, we advise investors who fear stock market failure. You can learn more at SmeadCap.com or by calling your financial advisor. Welcome to a Book with Legs podcast. I'm Cole Smead. I'm the CEO and a portfolio manager here at Smead Capital Management. At our firm, we are readers and book junkies. It can be said that leaders are readers, and we believe books provide us a great source of information for filtering what is and isn't important for us as investors. Investing is the last great liberal art and the best way to spend a lifetime of learning. This podcast is for readers, thinkers, business-minded people, and investors who want to grow their knowledge from great authors and their writing. Charlie Munger often talks about using multiple mental models and analysis. Our aim for this podcast is to help listeners test Munger's theory in business, markets, and people. Hosting this episode with me is our Chief Investment Officer, our Chairman, my dad, Bill Smead. Dad, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Let's see. I, I'll kind of go off script. W- what are you excited about today? I just love this book. It synthesized a whole bunch of different things I knew from studying history, and uh, but uh, the way it intertwined with the fundamentals of business is fantastic. I think we're going to have to start paying Greg directly to write more books because yeah. it's a blessing. And um, so for our audience, thank you for joining us for this episode. Uh, we're going to discuss one of the great financing minds of the last millennia. Joining us for the second time on the podcast is Greg Steinmetz to discuss his book, The Richest Man Who Ever Lived, The Life and Times of Jacob Fugger. A little about Greg for our audience, um, just to reorient you with him as an author. He spent 15 years working as a journalist for the Sarasota Herald Tribune, Houston Chronicle, Newsday, and the Wall Street Journal. While at the Wall Street Journal, he served as the bureau chief in Berlin and London. He is a securities analyst at Ruane, Cunniff, and Goldfarb, the manager of the Sequoia Fund. Greg joined us on the first season of the podcast to talk about his newer book about Jay Gould, uh, which is titled American Rascal, was a true treat. It's great great to have you back to talk about Jacob Fugger. Um, You know, just kickstart us off. You know, I'd love to hear the story of what made you aware of Fugger and then what drove you to make this your first work published, because that had to be quite an undertaking. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the chance to come back and and talk about this book. Uh, You know, I first heard about Fugger in a freshman year uh, history class at college about the uh, Renaissance and Reformation. The the Reformation, as we know, is one of the pivotal events in world history because it uh, cleaved Christianity between those who would follow the Pope and those who wanted to follow Martin Luther and others who were questioning the papacy and the the rule from Rome. Fugger was instrumental in making that happen. And it wasn't that he wanted to divide the church. He wanted the other thing to happen. He wanted the Pope to maintain its supremacy one of the things the Pope was doing was um, raising money to fight his wars and maintain the power of the papacy. At the time, the the papacy has very little to do uh, with what it does today. The, mm-hmm. uh, the Pope was the equivalent of a king. He had his own army. He was trying to expand his territories. He just did it a little differently. He had the extra weapon of being able to, to promise people uh, eternal salvation. So he and Fugger got involved in a money-making scheme uh, called indulgences, where if you paid a fee, you could lessen your time in purgatory. Uh, Fugger came up with this idea. He was instrumental in collecting the money, mostly from uh, German peasants uh, to fill the Pope's pockets. Martin Luther got very upset about this and uh, started the Reformation basically as a reaction against the indulgence scheme. So anyway, in freshman year history class, this was mentioned for about one day, but the name stuck <laughs> in my head. And then when I was in Germany, the the name Fugger in Germany is something like the name Rockefeller here. If you want to say that someone's loaded, you say he's as rich as Fugger. And I was thinking, okay, well, who is this guy? Uh, I tried to find a book in English about him. There wasn't very much except some sort of dry academic texts. So I thought, well, I'm a writer. I can I can maybe write something. So uh, seven years of effort later, I came up with the book. So let's start with his lineage. Uh, teach us about the people before him in the house of Fugger. Well, to become very rich in those days, particularly as a peasant, you have to start with some money. 
His grandfather was a peasant in the countryside near Augsburg, which is a city in Bavaria, uh, sort of a, a distant suburb of Munich, it takes about an hour on the train. He, the grandfather dabbled in textiles. Uh, the area was uh, famous for its linen. Uh, they could grow the, the, the flax there, make nice linen shirts that didn't itch that much. His grandfather, in addition to, to being a farmer, got into this business of, of weaving. Then his son took it over and Fugger took it to the next level. It was the the father who struck up the first relationship with Emperor uh, Maximilian, who came riding into Augsburg one day and uh, needed some stuff. And Fugger stepped up and said, well, I can I can make you some cloth for your journey, whatever you need. Uh, that was uh, Jacob Fugger's first introduction to to the emperor. And Jacob, when he took over the family business and textiles, he nurtured that relationship and became very tied in with the Habsburgs. How did the scribe get the family name wrong? Well, in those days, it, it was a show of sophistication to write your name in Latin. And the way that Fugger spelled F-U-G-G-E-R uh, was spelled in German. The Latin translation came out as F-U-C-K-E-R, which is, is <laughs> funny, but it's it was just uh, coincidental. I think. But there have been those who have said, you know, the guy was exactly that. Those who don't like capitalism very much, they they get a good chuckle out of that. So talk a bit about his upbringing, uh, Fugger, and where he went to learn his craft. Yeah, that's really interesting. The, the, the only formal education that people would get those days, you learn some reading and writing, you would be taught by monks. Uh, there wasn't any sort of business school. There were, I think the University of Bologna was already in business. I think Oxford was in business, but they were in the business of training priests. There was no business school per se, but there were apprenticeships. Fugger went down to Venice. In Venice, there was a warehouse where the doges allowed the Germans to uh, bring their goods and trade with Venice by keeping them all together in one building it was a way to keep an eye on them, make sure that Venice collected all the taxes that were due to it. And Fugger went down there for a while and saw how how money was made in those days, saw what people were trading, uh, how they invoiced, how they collected the money, how they uh, went after bad debtors, what the the, the politics were of trading over uh, state lines like that. And he really got what at the time was probably about the best sort of business training imaginable. Uh, business was tough in those days. Um, he probably slept on a straw mat in a, in a drafty attic room, something like that. But he was very interested in making money and I'm sure the, the hardships uh, meant nothing to him because it must've been so fascinating that he, a guy like him probably enjoyed every minute of it. And then after so, that, he he learned also when he was in Italy, he learned about bookkeeping, which at the time, uh, modern day accounting didn't exist north of the Alps. Uh, double entry bookkeeping was was in its infancy. Fugger learned that down there and he brought it back to Germany. Teach our, our listeners about the importance of cities in Europe and, and how important Venice was. And you, you already kind of hinted at how important Venice was. Yeah. Well, Venice is strategically located in northern Italy at what is about the furthest north you could go by ship. Uh, so if you came, you could you know even start in East Asia and start in India, go around the Cape, come up through uh, the Straits of Gibraltar through the Mediterranean. And if you wanted to get to Northern Europe, the easiest place to access Northern Europe was in Venice. Uh, and you wanted to keep your, you wanted to keep your goods on the water as long as you could. Uh, the travel time was, wasn't so bad and the goods were safer when they're on ship than when you were uh, going down some trail in the middle of the woods where you were 
uh, vulnerable to robber barons coming in and taking everything that you have. Uh, so Venice was was right there in very good location. You know, Genoa was its rival. It was on the other side of the Italian peninsula, uh, very well situated to get goods to France. Venice was very well situated to get goods to Germany and the rest of Eastern Europe. Who, who were the big banking names uh, in Germany, Italy, and places at the time that Fugger emerged? Well, the names that we know, of course, uh, are the Medici. The, the Medici who made the family fortune wasn't Lorenzo. We hear about Lorenzo because of his involvement with Leonardo and other artists, his philanthropic works and his hobbies, that sort of thing. But the one who made the money was, was Cosimo Medici. He was uh, the patriarch of the family, and he uh, was such a successful banker in Florence that he ended up grabbing a lot of political power uh, and passed it on to Lorenzo. I think Lorenzo actually went bankrupt. He, he ran the company business into the ground, but there was enough money there that he could he could sustain it. His interests weren't in, in making money as much as his father's were. So that was the big name in Italy. The, the other names in Germany, no one was a household name, uh, but we do know about the Hanseatic League, which some of your listeners might be familiar with. They were a, a trading outfit that controlled all of the trade in the Baltic and the North Sea. And it, it got to the point where it was really ruled by the business class in these areas. And uh, Fugger and Neville ended up working both with and against the Hanseatic League uh, with his trading up in Northern Germany. Because they really, they it, it kind of uh, the, the Hanseatic League kind of smacks of you know what a very strong kind of global union uh, power, if you will, where you know like a port, a, a ship can't leave a port uh, loaded by a non-union uh, you know uh, company Cartel and then and then be unloaded by a union. It would have to go back to its original port, and it seems like the Hanseatic League had that kind of power in global trade at the time. You know, they had that sort of power, except the difference is you would be splitting the profits among all the union members. Gotcha. And the, the Hanseatic League was a group of German merchants who you know, recruited young men to join, put them through rigorous initiation rituals to make sure that they would be tough enough. Because in addition to having to be a good trader, you know, know the quality of goods, know what to pay for goods, you also had to be tough because they were inevitably going to be uh violent fights at the ports and other places. You know, there'd be naval battles between sure. rival factions. Uh, a very different way of doing business. It was very bare knuckled. Totally. We just happened to do that in politics instead today. We're a little more civil. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so teach us about Archduke Sigmund and why was he such a good banking prospect to finance? Yeah. Uh, Sigmund Rich in Coins, that was his name. And the reason he, he was the... Uh, he was a Habsburg who ruled the Duchy of Tyrol, which is where uh, Salzburg and Innsbruck are, you know, beautiful Alpine state. But that's all it was. It was a little state. But it happened to sit on the biggest silver deposit in all of Europe. Uh, Sigmund would mine the, mine the silver, turn it into coins, uh, use that to mostly spend money on himself. He loved building castles. And he built a bunch of castles for himself across the Tyrol. He wasn't very interested in fighting wars and paying mercenaries and, and raising an army and that sort of thing. It was, it was more about just indulging himself. Uh, Fugger got, got to know Sigmund and worked out a deal with him so that Sigmund could optimize and, and maximize what he, was, what he was getting out of his silver mines. And that got... Uh, Fugger involved with the Habsburgs, but Fugger recognized that that Sigmund wasn't really the best client because he was unreliable and he was also a little bit crazy and the people didn't like him. And Fugger was worried that it wasn't uh, the best business partner for him. So he switched his allegiance to another branch of the Habsburgs and was instrumental in organizing a coup against Sigmund, which allowed uh, Maximilian the first to take over as, as emperor. And from there, 
Maximilian, unlike Sigmund, was very interested in territorial conquest. And by using the silver mines and Fugger's expertise, both in banking and in uh, engineering, uh, Fugger hired the best mining engineers in the world and figured out how to get even more silver out of these places. Maximilian was able to dramatically expand the the Habsburgs uh, territory. Well, to your point, he was effectively swapping current debt uh, I'll call it, he was taking on sovereign debt risk for uh, almost like a strip or or a stream off of the future mine production. But obviously he was doing that at a price that was in his best interest to sell the silver after it was produced. So he was collecting the commodity at a discount, if you will. But ultimately all this financing, and I think it's very apropos to think about this today, this all was you know, sovereign debt he was taking on ultimately for war financing. And I think in Sigmund's case, he was going to go after uh, the, the Doge of Venice. Um, he wanted to go across the mountains and go down into Italy. As I think about it today, I mean, think of all the debt that's been taken on. We didn't fight an explicit war. We fought a kind of a, uh, a disease, if you will. But do you see any difference between, you know, large buildup of sovereign debt like was in his day with what we see today as any different for the effects it has on society? Well, one difference was that debt in Fugger's day was collateralized. You wouldn't have advanced the money to the emperor mm-hmm. had there not been silver sta- behind that and had sure. his contracts not been very strong and had he not had the confidence uh, that he could collect. Now, the emperor, whether it was Sigmund or Maximilian, could have just had Fugger rounded up and shot, uh, but that would have made it very hard for for them to ever borrow money again, at least on a large scale. <laughs> yeah. So you, you have the you know the counterparty issue. And uh, so Fugger could loan with confidence that he could get his money back. So it was more like loaning against a home. Sure. Uh, more than just borrowing against the, the faith, faith and credit and, of, yeah. a, of a sovereign. Faith and credit. Yeah. 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 So in Argentina, right? You're not. You might not get paid back. Uh, it's a yeah. different situation because Argentina is not going to surrender, you know, Patagonia to repay a loan. Totally. Um, it, you mentioned uh, how important Frankfurt was from a commercial perspective, and you talked about the Frankfurt Festival. Could you yeah. teach our listeners somewhat about that? Well, in those days, trade fairs were a very big deal. Uh, nowadays, they're still important, particularly in Germany. The tradition lives on. There's a lot of business that goes on at fairs, but those days, that was the only place where business happened. So sure. once a year, people from all over Europe would descend on Frankfurt and bring their stuff and buyers would come and trade whatever they had. Uh, Fugger would bring textiles. Other people would bring uh, gold, silver, uh, livestock, carpets, all sorts of things. It would all happen in Frankfurt, and Fugger made it a point to go there and not only to trade, but also to get new clients, to get information. Um, it was it was very important for the way business went on in those days. You know, so Maxim- in the absence of communication, like we have today. Yeah, Maximilian and Fugger met there. Would it be fair to say that no one expected what would become of them? In other words, not you know, it's not like they you know shook hands and you know the the Frankfurt Sea parted and everyone said, "Oh my gosh, you've met the Christ and you're going to do business together." This was very unknown at that time. Well, they were both young men in a hurry, and just as no one could have predicted that Fugger, who was you know one of many people who was working in textiles and banking in Augsburg, uh, would become the richest peasant who ever lived. No one would have yeah. predicted that Maximilian would one day become emperor of, of everything in Europe with the exception of France and have dominion that went all the way over to uh, South America. Sure. And by the way, you also, I don't, I don't know if you caught on this, but I think you were touching on that Airbnb has a business model that's been around for you know centuries. Um, because as you pointed out during the Frankfurt Festival, how much money people could make from renting out their floors of their homes or just space to sleep. People. Yeah, no, that's true. It's fascinating. So, you know, I, I tried to get in humorous or uh, salacious stuff whenever I could to make the book interesting. So there I got to mention that you know, prostitutes would come to Frankfurt from far and wide to, to uh, work the fair. Uh, 
peasant girls. It was their one chance a year to make big money. And prostitution was actually legal. Uh, there was there was no restrictions on that. So that sort of trade was going on. Uh, yes, people would rent out their homes. People would rent out rooms. People would would be able to earn enough money during that one week to to last them the whole year long. That's how that's how busy uh, these Frankfurt got during that those few weeks. And you know, you would I guess nowadays you would talk about surge pricing, and surge pricing definitely applied at the well, Frankfurt we, it, Fair. It, 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 it sounds yeah. like the Phoenix Open. Yeah, I was gonna say we, we have that going on here. It's one week, actually a couple of weeks because you got Barrett Jackson, you got the Phoenix Open, stiletto heels yeah, walking yeah, around the golf course. Yeah, and 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 the working and non-working uh, folk, I'll call it, uh, do show up, and the Airbnb market goes bonker. So we, I, when you were saying that in your book, I thought, wow. The trade shows still go on. <laughs> Ma Maximilian took control of the duchy via financing. Explain how he took advantage of the free spending Sigmund. Well, Sigmund was getting old. He he might have had syphilis. He wasn't. He didn't have all his marbles intact. And Maximilian was was able to work out a deal with him to let him, you know, hold on to some of the vestiges and power if he would turn over the keys to him. Um, and the way that they got Sigmund to agree was that Fugger said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to finance Maximilian instead. And without, without access to capital, that was the end of Sigmund. So he, he lived out his days as a doddering old fool in one of his castles and, uh, Maximilian, who was about Fugger's age, they got into business together and, and, uh, changed history. So Sigmund didn't die a pauper. Uh, Maximilian let him live out his life. Do you think this, it, in today's culture, I, do you think Joe Biden will let uh, Donald Trump live out his life? Do people show that kind of mercy in today's day and age? Uh, well, lock him up would probably be something that people would be saying about Biden, just like they were saying about Hillary. So, sure. And if you look what Biden is trying to do to Trump, he's not letting Trump live out his days either. Yeah, because that was a level of mercy in your book that we thought, wow, that is unprecedented in our They were family. Society. Yeah, they were family. And I guess he realized Sigmund was harmless here. Uh, but, you know, another interesting sidebar in Sigmund, uh, he had so much silver that he was minting these silver coins and they were pure silver. And everyone knew that if they saw Sigmund's uh, likeness on a coin, that it, it was probably 100% silver. They called these things the Taller, which was uh, the German word for valley. They came from the Tyrolean Valley. And the, both the weight and that name Taller, you know, morphed into dollar and it became the standard unit of gold currency. Um, and that lasted for a long time, whether it was Spanish doubloons or or French money or whatever it else, it was always the, the same weight and uh, the same purity as what Sigmund and Fugger were minting in Tyrol. So, so Maximilian uh, begins his empire building. Uh, where does he march next from there? Well, he goes into southern Italy, and he has some successes and some failures, but he he does well enough so that he wants more. Uh, now, the way Maximilian acquired territory wasn't just through war. He was he had a, a mixed record as a warrior but he had a very good record for uh, making advantageous marriages. So he married well, and more importantly, his son uh, married very well. His son, Charles, married uh, into the, the Spanish empire. And through that, the Habsburgs had control of both Eastern Europe, extending all the way from Austria to uh, the Balkans. And they also had Spain and because of Spain, they ended up getting control of, of South America. Re reading your book hit me. It hit me very hard. I, I never understood as a young person reading about World War I why Archduke Ferdinand being killed in Yugoslavia caused all these nations to line up 
at each other and start shooting across the two mile expanse. And, and, uh, and your book, your book helped me understand based on what you just said, that, that, that was, that was the connection there. Well, there was World War II, there was, there were all these alliances, right? So Russia protected Serbia and Croatia was aligned with Austria and Germany. So there were these secret alliances and, and once it was like NATO. It's the same thing as NATO. If there was an attack on a NATO country, everyone would rally, we think, and defend that NATO member. And that's what was going on in World War I. One of the, the best books for me that really explains the, the culture and the society down in the Balkans is a bit book called The Bridge on the River Drina. Yeah. Have you ever heard of that? Won a, it won a Nobel Prize back when it was written. And it really talks about how in the Balkans, you have these you know three tectonic plates that come together. So it's, it's very volatile on the margins. So you had the Orthodox Christians, the Catholics, and the Muslims. They all come together right in the Balkans. So every 50 years or so, it goes up in flames. Fugger saw large opportunities in mining, obviously from Schwaz, okay? Uh, but but understood the risks inherently involved. Can you explain, you know, how Fugger looked at the risks of commodities? And because you talked a little bit about how you could go broke in this. Yeah. Well, commodity pr- prices fluctuate, and it costs a lot of money to to mine the commodities. Uh, you're very prone to having flooding in the mines. You could ruin everything. The the way that Fugger he did a couple things to minimize his risk. One, there wasn't just the mine in, in Schwarz in the Tyrol, which was the biggest silver mine in the world. He he was involved in, with other mines. Uh, Hungary was very rich in copper. There were other silver belts uh, in Europe where he was involved. Again, all under the protection and in relation to the Habsburgs. So there was some diversification there. He also... I think I mentioned he he hired the best mining engineers in the country, mm-hmm. in the world to to keep his mines from flooding, and he also created demand uh, by reaching out to to buyers all over the world, uh, including as far away as India, where they just didn't have the resource that was available in Europe. So, Fugger arranged to trade metal for spices in India. So he he kept the markets. Uh, you know, he did his his bid on the sales. He did his bid on on risk, and uh, with technology, just to make sure that that he always stayed above water. Now, he was also lucky. There were others who were trying to do the same thing as Fugger was, but we don't hear about them because they did get in over their skis and they got wiped out. Sure, uh, and spent time. Debtors' prisons were very much a thing in those days, and one of his biggest rivals in in uh, in Augsburg ended up dying in debtor's prison. So in the in the copper deposits in Hungary, I think you point out a really interesting tidbit because he was the investor, he was the owner, um, but he was also German and Hungarians and Germans might not mix. Yeah. Uh, but they they all spoke the language of money. And and that was good enough. But Fugger did have to to keep his guard up and, and make sure that in addition to having Germans on his payroll, he, he needed to have some Hungarians too and Poles and he needed he needed some local folks to help navigate those those uh shoals for him. Yeah, because he ended up giving part of the interest in the mine to uh, his Hungarian partner. And his name's not coming to me off the top of my head, but it showed you also he was a pragmatist. In other words, he wanted to make money, but was willing to give a cut to people to ensure that he could make that money. Yeah, and that's you know, the old Roman Empire trick: uh, don't have too firm a hand. Uh, let the let local culture uh, coexist. Otherwise, you're going to be fighting rebellions every day. Yeah, Greg, explain the postal advantage and branch network that Fugger began accumulating. But it's it's very interesting to think about how instead of having to to carry around sacks of gold between towns to pay for things, his empire was so fast vast he could just credit an account in at one branch and debit it in another. Um, 
And that was only possible if you had operations and, and branches all over all over the place. And, and yeah. he did. So a merchant up in uh, on the North Sea, Rostock or Lubeck or Hamburg or something might want to buy something from Fugger. Instead of having to, to send sacks of gold across Germany and go through you know, 30 different uh, duchies, principalities, and other things to make it to Augsburg, uh, Fugger could just uh, credit his bank up in Hamburg and debit the one in Augsburg and ship the goods. And that was the end of it. So yeah. that, gave, that gave him a big advantage. No one else could do that. He had hands on the ground. Explain the advantage that gave him in his negotiation with King Henry and Maximilian to take back Burgundy. <laughs> well, the well, he was involved a little bit with Henry VIII, uh, more Henry the Seventh, who who was a very good fiscal steward of of uh, of England, and because Fugger was so rich, uh, Henry had some business dealings with Fugger. Now the Burgundy thing was, was by marriage. Uh, Maximilian married uh, Mary of Burgundy. It's, it's interesting. We were just talking about the jewelry business here in the office the other day. And we asked, you know, we we're wondering how the engagement ring business got started. And that's because Maximilian gave Mary the a diamond and as we see now in the luxury goods market, once when celebrities and rich people start giving giving something and making it popular, then then everyone wants to be part of that, and that's what happened in the engagement ring world. And because of Fugger, uh, Maximilian was able to raise a nice endowment and and marry this Mary of of Burgundy. Burgundy at the time was. Uh, if if not the most powerful part of France, certainly as powerful as anything else, uh, under Mary's father Charles the Bold, uh, it was uh, renowned for having the best army in all of Europe, and because uh, Maximilian could bring some money to the table, he was able to marry into the uh, the uh, that family. Uh, and because he there weren't any sons that Charles the Bold had, Maximilian became king of Burgundy as well as Austria. As you point out, or yeah, he was crowned in worms. He was king. What was the German word that they hailed him as? Kaiser. Is that the word you were thinking of? Yeah. 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 It was a, yeah. a follow on from Roman times. Caesar. Is, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's great. Hitler's whole thousand year Reich thing was be, the thousand year Reich was the Holy Roman Empire, which lasted from 800 to uh, Napoleon a thousand years later. Yeah. A small man's complex dominates. As you point out, it wasn't long before he was sitting in a Flemish jail. Explain the assemblies and all, uh, also the electors he now had to deal with. There was no democracy, but it wasn't sole rule either. Yeah, the Holy Roman Empire was was a strange construct in that it was a, a an empire in, in name only sort of you know, the the joke Napoleon told that it was it was neither holy nor roman nor an empire. It there were I don't know, a thousand city-states and principalities and duchies and kingdoms uh in in German speaking Europe. It, the the original idea was to unite all of Christian Europe under a secular equivalent of the Pope. So you had the Pope down in Rome, and you had Charlemagne, who was crowned in, by the Pope in the year 800, as the secular equivalent, just to keep everyone together and uh, keep the peace and resolve conflicts. Maximilian became the, the emperor of this thing, but the, the way it happened was by an election among seven electors, uh, four of whom were bishops, three of whom were secular rulers. Uh, they were all uh, from different parts of Germany. So you had an elector in Worms, you had one in Dresden, you had one in the 
what's now the Czech Republic, but it was German in those days. Uh, and you had the Habsburgs. And it just, it, it made things easier to keep electing Habsburgs to this post. But in the election where Maximilian became emperor, there were others who wanted it because they saw an opportunity to make more money for themselves. Uh, if they could turn this, this strange thing of being Holy Roman Empire emperor into being an actual emperor with, with all the powers that that entailed. So there was a, an election where you had Henry VIII put his hat in the ring. Uh, you had Maximilian put his hat in the ring and there was, there was one other. Do you, do you remember who that was? Um, it was, no, it was France. It was Charles. France, yeah. France. Yeah. France is the first in France. Um, and they all wanted it. And it became a, a contest to who could bribe the electors the most. <laughs> and because of Fugger, uh, Maximilian was able to put up the most money and he, he seized the day and won the election. He understood the power of precious resources. Did it become a winner take all business from here on out from Maximilian and the Habsburg dynasty? Yeah, well, he he was extremely ambitious and he thought that uh, you know, God was on his side. So he, he kept fighting these little wars, uh, mostly in Italy, didn't get very far. The the Pope was able to to keep him out of Rome. Uh, the Duke of Milan was able to hold him back for a while. And he he never really achieved his territorial ambition in Europe. He was never able to wrest that much power from the other uh, big monarchs in Germany, the other electors. And in some ways, being emperor was a ceremonial title. Uh, he could he could try to uh, claim that he had more authority than the others, but when push came to shove, he really didn't. Although the the people, the you know the peasants work in the fields, and they they thought that he was uh, divine and would come up and you know touch him, thinking that he had magic healing powers and all that stuff. Um, but again, what what his his best successes were with marriages, and how he was able to get France for or Burgundy for himself, and how he was able to get Spain uh, for uh, his son. Yeah, to your point and Bill's point earlier on World War One, I, I think of it as like World War One was actually a family split where you had cousins falling on one side of the line or the other. Ultimately. Um, and I, maybe that's why family starts with an F. Um, so to another F, let's go back to Fugger. Um, he, you, you make the case he was an intellectual long before there was such a group, you know, in, you know, call it the Renaissance time or what we now know as, you know, kind of college educated intellectualism, uh, in America. Um, but you point out now that that's mainstream, he was also a fervent Catholic, who believed that God had a plan for him and, and God had blessed him to do what he did. In other words, there was a purpose. He was there on earth uh, doing what he was doing. Um, that is not mainstream today. So I, I guess, you know, this mix of pragmatism and business and providence seems like a big driver for him individually. In other words, that's he could go out with purpose because he was trying to solve something and he had God on his side. Well, yeah, who knows? Who knows how far skepticism went in those days? Okay. There were so many unknowns. Um, you had, you know, the plague in the in the 14th century. You had life was very fragile. It was completely unex uncontrollable. You couldn't explain things. Uh, everyone, almost everyone, you know, uh, at least said that they were believers. What what Fugger really believed, I don't know, but he certainly acted as if uh, he believed there was a good chance that that there was a God, and you see that you see that most in the way he he uh, he prepared for the afterlife. Um, he knew that he was violating commandments. He knew that he was by lending money that he was in violation of. Not just the usury ban, however Rogue might interpret it, but also, you know, the words of the uh, of the New Testament. So when 
when he wrote his will, he was very clear that he wanted you know, to give money to the church. He wanted to make sure that people were praying for him after he died. And he was just doing everything he could to atone for, for his sins. Like a lot of rich people, he was able to rationalize what he was doing and probably did think that he was doing, <laughs> right? thought that he yeah, was I doing see. the Lord's work by, yeah, by he, making he money for himself. He might have taken the billionaire's pledge, you might say, right? Yeah. He didn't have children of his own, sure. which is interesting. Let's, so he just. Let's pivot to your, you, you used a very interesting term in explaining him. Um, what is vi vitamin B to a German? Because I had never heard that term as an American. Yeah, it's a German expression. Vitamin B means, uh, it's the German word for relationships, Beziehungen. And in those days where you really had to rely on trust uh, much more than you do today because you have contracts, you have rule of law, sure. trust was a big deal in those days. And connections are what made the world go around and you know they still do but even more so in those days With, without without the proper introductions you could get nowhere by the way um fuger would be the last guy i'd ever want to be sitting across the table from playing uh, a game of texas hold'em poker with um because you explained wonderfully you know he gets involved in a copper cartel with his hungry hungry and assets and then can you explain the strange twist in the plot that follows yeah, he the the copper mines in Hungary and Slovakia were the, were the biggest were the biggest around, but he was sort of at the height of his powers, just as the Reformation was getting started. Uh, and again, he not not because he wanted it to happen, but he played a key role in making the uh, Reformation happen. Uh, and the peasants saw an opportunity to seize power from from the monarchs because the monarchs were were all aligned with rome and because of luther and the way he publicized the inequities it was plain to everyone well wait a minute why why are we listening to mass that's in latin uh why are we paying all this money to rome uh who's to say that the priests are the only ones who can interpret the bible and they seem to be inconsistent they seem to be actually doing things that the Bible says you shouldn't be doing enough of this. Uh, and there were rebellions that spread out all over Germany and also in Hungary. So Fugger had to defend his, his assets in Hungary. And that wasn't so easy because the peasants had enough resources to, to take over the mines to, to hold Fugger's people in Hungary hostage, and Fugger had to to fight back pretty hard, and spent you know, the latter years of his life negotiating to get back his territory uh, and his mines in Hungary. Uh, there were there were rival politicians who who aligned with the peasants and and took over these properties, and Fugger uh, wanted either uh, restitution or he wanted to get his stuff back, and Wait. he finally did. You know, just at the end of his life. When prior to that, you also explained his his um, in that copper cartel, he had joined it and then turned around and in kind of a, a Rockefeller cut to kill fashion, he chopped the legs off of everybody in the cartel by underpricing everyone and taking them out of business, which again, that, that's why I mentioned earlier, you know, he's a tough guy to play cards with because one minute he's your ally and if he sees an opportunity to ruin you, he would take it. Yeah, you know that's, <laughs> you know what when you're when you're playing poker, you know what the rules are, uh, and you enter into that agreement when you sit down at the table. And so, people who did business with Fugger knew that well. This this arrangement's only going to last as long as it's in Fugger's interest. Yeah, uh, a cartel is only as as good as the willingness of the participants to to play along and not slash prices. Fugger saw an opportunity. He was liquid enough that he could do that. And he made the calculation that he could wipe out his, the others. And he was correct in that calculation. You know, he, he's he, a very he, smart guy that way. He, he, well, he left himself an out well, and nobody well, else did. Yeah. He had the dub, the double entry accounting. Fugger married at age 39, speaking of alliances to a younger woman, 
Fugger married for logical reasons, money and status. Augsburg limited party size. How did Fugger deal with this? Oh, the, the size of weddings and yes. all that? Yeah. Yes, yeah. I love this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that anecdote, I, I forget exactly what happened. Maybe you can refresh me. Because well, yeah, I know he did have a big party and he brought yeah. in oysters. He had a yeah. wedding in January because the oysters would stay fresh. Correct. Yeah, I remember that in your book, but I think it was uh, there was a certain limit. I don't remember the number in your book, and so that I think the town had said, "Here's our limit on party size." And so he threw a massive wedding in comparison and just paid the tax. And just paid the tax. <laughs> but well, yeah, you see that today too, right? If, well, okay, if the fine's only a thousand dollars for making noise after midnight, there's plenty of people who don't bat an eye. Well, and I also think back to the pandemic. You know, if they said, "Hey, it's going to be a thousand dollars if you throw an unsanctioned party." Well, you just pay the thousand dollars and throw a wonderful big party. <laughs> yeah, you know, you throw a fifty thousand dollar party, and what's a thousand dollars? Exactly. Jewels became an interest for Fugger. Explain the Three Brothers Jewel and its historical significance. Well, Fugger got a hold of of one of the most uh, interesting pieces of jewelry in the world, uh, and he kept and sort of. Uh, his rainy day account was uh, jewelry. Uh, people would use jewelry as a store of value. They would use silver plate, which whatever it would be, you know, silverware, uh, drinking vessels, whatever it is that you could make out of silver. You just had this stuff lying around uh, as a way to to have some you know, somewhat liquid assets always at your disposal. Jewelry was one of those because, as it is today, it was portable. Uh, very valuable. That that jewel somehow ended up uh, belonging to Queen Elizabeth I in London. One of the most famous paint, uh, uh, paintings of her shows her wearing wearing this uh, this particular uh, piece of jewelry, and you know it just got passed on through generation through you know one monarch monarchy after another had this thing. Fugger and other financiers were not just affecting Europe. Explain how their investments were reaching to the New World and other continents. Well, Maximilian I and his son, uh, Charles, uh, Charles married into the, the family of, of Ferdinand and Isabella. Uh, and, you know, as we know, Ferdinand and Isabella were the ones that bankrolled Columbus in 1492 and put the the Spaniards in South America. Charles married uh, one of their uh, daughters, and so he inherited Spain, I mean, not Spain, South America, and Fugger was involved uh, a little bit with some of the, the transatlantic trade that was just in its infancy. He was also involved, and he did this uh, secretly, he was involved with with Portugal, which was Spain's great rival. Uh, Portugal, as we know, Magellan was Portuguese. Mm -hmm. Portugal uh, paid for Magellan's round the world journey, all of this stuff. And Fugger was the one who secretly bankrolled this adventure, thinking, "Okay, I'm going to not only uh, have commercial dealings with the Habsburgs, make a, a lot of money off them, but I'm going to hedge my bets a little bit in case." Portugal ends up being the winner in in South America, and the Pope famously, you know, drew a line through South America, which uh, granted the the eastern portion to the Portuguese. That's Brazil, and that's why they speak Portuguese in Brazil. And the rest of it went to Spain. Uh, this was all, you know, happening during Fugger's time. Fugger sent copper and silver to Portugal. What did they send back? Well, the Portuguese got spices from India, and that's what made that uh, Portugal a little country, but they were very powerful. This was the, the heyday of the Portuguese emperor, uh, empire. It's funny, just yesterday, um, I got a note from my agent and that uh, we sold the the Portuguese rights to the book, this book. And we we had already sold the Brazilian rights, and it got published in Brazil. But apparently, the Portuguese is different enough in Portugal, so they wanted their own translation. That's funny. So, when it also it also proves that Fugger proved uh, a long time ago that Germans love their spicy curry. <laughs> well, if you've been to Berlin, you know that, right? Correct. Currywurst. Yeah. yeah. 
exactly. So um, forced unsecured lending on Fugger was no way to bargain, right? No one was going to show up to your discussion earlier about the poker table and tell Fugger to lend and, and you have no other option. I'm going to quote your book here. Um, quote, they failed to understand that it is for the common good that honorable, brave, and honest companies are in the realm. And Fugger is obviously saying this, for it is not disreputable, but rather it is a wonderful jewel that such companies are in the kingdom. End quote. He ended the letter with a vague threat. Quote, reasonable people know this and would be wise to consider. End quote. So Fugger is saying this in a backhanded way uh, to Maximilian at the time. Doesn't this sound like any of the political rhetoric of our day as well? Um, it, it was kind of, you know, you're going to be forced to do this uh, as a rich person in society. It would, you know, it, between him and, and, and the king, it was really kind of a soak the rich. You're going to have to do this whether you like it. But Fugger, you know, had options. Switzerland was not that far away as a tax haven even then. And again, that's true today. So how do you look at this idea? And I, I actually really thought of it in almost an estate planning context. Um, you know, you, you could die, pay 45% of your quote unquote taxable estate here in the United States and whatever you pay to your state, if any, or you could end up in the Bahamas, <laughs> AKA the Western hemispheres, Switzerland. Uh, it, it isn't this identical. It's just the same problem oh, sure. completely manifest in a different era. Yeah. Uh, rich people have choices, right? They can, they can. They can go wherever they want. And if someone promises them a more favorable tax regime and the assets can be relocated, um, yeah, sure, sure, it's identical. But th this this point about you know some of that stuff you were just reading about, that to me was that's the importance of Fugger. Mm -hmm. He he was the first commoner who was able to stand up to power and say, we have a contract here. You have to pay up. And Fugger's the, the thing that made Fugger Fugger was that he had leverage over his borrowers uh, that no other banker before him ever had. They would the sovereigns would look down on him because he was a commoner. Uh, he didn't have the the hand of God uh, looking over them like the emperor thought that he did and the electors did. Uh, he didn't have the divine sanction, and yet he was able to have power over them. And it's been like that ever since, where sure. those who have the money, um, you know, you, you talked about Argentina and sovereign debt before. Uh, the, the creditors have a lot of a lot of power. Uh, yeah. You talked about Abraham Lincoln. What, what was what was the big concern about financing during the Civil War? What what would happen to the faith and credit of the U.S. government if they couldn't pay back on those bonds after the war. Um, this this sort of thinking, uh, the the ability of of someone with a contract to to get a sovereign to pay, force the sovereign to pay, just did not exist before Fugger. He was the first one to really stand up and make it work, and that opened up the doors for others and emboldened others to to loan to sovereigns. So Fugger was a banker with unlimited liability. Explain how his banking operation worked. Oh, uh, well, he got deposits just like banks do today. Uh, rich people would give them money in return for interest and he would lend the money out, uh, use it to not just make loans, but to to do what would now be you know, private, equity deals uh with mines and and other uh adventures you know trading spices trading other commodities trading textiles um and then he would pay his depositors interest on it and he always paid uh and he did not have a shortage of people who wanted to come to him and give them their money same as today, right? If, if you have money, what are you going to do with it? You got to give it to someone. And Fugger had the trust of, of his depositors, and he made a good return for them. Cardinal Macau uh, died. How did this cause a run on Fugger, and what was the solution? Well, he was, he was one of Fugger's big depositors. And when he died, there was an assumption that, that his money, uh, because 
he was a cardinal, wouldn't stay in the family, right? There was no family. Uh, he didn't officially have children, although I'm sure he did have some, uh, but they weren't heirs. <laughs> and there is the assumption that this money would just flow to Rome and Rome was not going to keep it in the, in, uh, with, with Fugger. So there was a run on the bank and Fugger in, in, in a stunt that, you know, we still see today, uh, pretended that there was nothing wrong, pretended that things were never better. Uh, he hosted a party, very lavish party to show how rich he was to remind people. He, uh, went around from town to town in southern Germany, you know, dressed in his his finest clothes and on his best horses with you know, 13 horses leading leading his coach, uh, throwing uh, coins to the to the peasants who were following after after his his coach. He, he just wanted to show, even though he was facing the gravest crisis of his career, he wanted to show that he was very rich and powerful and create the impression at least that there was nothing to worry about and by doing this and then by working out a deal with the pope so that the pope would keep uh the money with the fuggers he was able to get out of this jam that was the the most precarious uh moment in fuggers career and he was able to to fake his way out of trouble greg by random chance at 6 30 in the morning Monday morning after the Friday that Ivan Boski was arrested, I was on, I was at Milken's trading floor with the guy that ran half the retail of the, uh, for Drexel Burnham and Milken was making all his calls, you know, get Erwin Jacobs on the line, get Carl Icon. He, he was making every attempt to look, make it look like it was business as usual, just, just like you're describing. Whereas the, the 30, men, I think it was almost all men, surrounding him the way it was all centered, you know, him in the middle with them the all around. The music had stopped. You could, hear, you could hear a pin drop in there. I mean, they weren't saying anything, you know, uh, and so it, very analogous situation. As we invest abroad for our investors, we think strong insider ownership is important to deal with, uh, 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 to, to deal with. The inside baseball. The, the, the in, inside baseball of places that you can't know. Uh, explain how Zinc was Fugger's st strong insider in Rome with the Vatican. The, Fugger, through his Augsburg connections, get, got to, to be friendly with a, a very corrupt lobbyist, as it were, mm -hmm. who, who worked the halls of the Vatican to Fugger's benefit. Uh, when they came up with the indulgence scheme, uh, that Luther vilified, it was Zinc who negotiated the terms of how uh, that transaction would work, where they would split the money between the Vatican and Fugger. And uh, Zinc, yeah, he was he was the bag man. He was the lobbyist. Uh, he was the German guy who had the ear of of the papal officials. And you know, Fugger was willing to bribe. He was willing to do whatever it took. To, to get what he wanted. And uh, Zinc was the guy who made it happen in Rome. Well, and-, and uh, Sounds like that one guy from Game of Thrones. Well, or, or past Glencore partners. Um, uh, I, I think the other thing that made me think a lot about is, uh, you know, the interaction, which was they go to the peasants, and you kind of touch on this, and I think we're gonna come back to this in just a second, but they go to the pe peasants and say, this is for St. Peter, or, or yeah, it was St. Peter's Basilica. They were going to rebuild it from its, I think you mentioned it was just wooden. It was nothing. And so it was all under the heading of like, let's put the apostle in a great resting place. Um, that was a small use of the money. Um, and then the profits were split between the Pope and Fugger from there. Yeah. And the, the Pope really wanted to, you know, show his wealth, show his power. Um, you know, nowadays you would, you would, pay influencers or you would run or blast ads. off to the moon. Yeah. Do something like that. <laughs> um, but in those days you would do it by, by building something very large that was visible that people would talk about that people would travel to see uh, whoever had the biggest building had the most power or perceived power. And so the Pope wanted to build 
this this giant complex in Rome. He needed the he needed a lot of money to to do it. Um, Fugger had had an issue with Rome in that one of the electors, you know, those seven men who decided who would be Holy Roman Emperor, uh, borrowed a bunch of money to bribe people to make himself an elector. He had to pay Fugger back. And in order for uh, Fugger's scheme to enable this guy to pay him back was to raise money with this indulgence program. The Pope signed off on it in return for running his own indulgence program for St. Peter's. Uh, and Fugger's people and some huckster priests you know, went around uh, throughout the German countryside and, and told this story about how if you give money uh, to Rome for this project for St. Peter's, you're, you will reduce your time in purgatory. What the what the promoters here weren't saying is, well, half of this money would also go to pay back Fugger for the bribes that were paid to make this one guy an elector. Uh, but the, the program had, had some success. It raised a lot of money. Uh, Fugger's people were were with the the hucksters every step of the way, counting the money, making sure it got to where it would be, keeping the records, and you know, this went on for for several months and and raised a lot of money that made both the Pope and Fugger happy, and St. Peter's got built. Discuss the idea of usury and why it was an issue in Germany in the early 16th century. Well, in in the New Testament, there's a line that says. You know, lend and expect nothing in return. The idea that you could make money from money uh, defied defied logic for some people, uh, because you're you're not giving someone something that has you know any tangible value. If you give someone a dollar, if they give you back a dollar, that that should be enough. Just like if I if I give you my car and you give me back another car that's identical, you know, that's a that's an even split. Uh, but in the case of loaning money, I give you a dollar and then you pay me back, you know, a dollar ten. That didn't seem right to uh, a lot of people, and the church uh, didn't like this because you know the, the the church wasn't wasn't all evil. They there were some things that they did that were very good. And one was that they tried to protect people from, from getting ripped off. And this was one way that they did it. They uh, money, money changers were, were common. Uh, and there were people who charged very high interest rates and they would ruin their borrowers if the borrower wouldn't pay back. So it was in, it was in Rome's interest to you know, try to protect the peasants. And one way of doing that was to outlaw usury. Now, the fact is, Borrowing is what makes the world go around, and despite um, you know, prohibitions from Rome and and fears of of being excommunicated and all of that, money lending was was prevalent. And uh, Fugger didn't like the idea that okay, I'm I'm loaning money, I'm collecting interest, but you know the the Bible is pretty clear that I shouldn't be doing this. It would be really nice for my eternal salvation if I could get the Pope to sanction this. And he worked with the Pope and did favors for the Pope, loaned money to the Pope, essentially bribed the Pope, and the Pope agreed to legalize uh, money lending. And the definition of usury changed. And it was because of, of these decisions that uh, usury became, or I shouldn't use the word usury because nowadays usury means loaning it, you know, a confiscatory rate. Then it just meant receiving any sort of interest. Well, it's uh, that, the Pope that, signed that, off that, on that, it. That was Pope, Pope Leo, Pope Leo correctly. Yeah. He, mm -hmm. he correctly, I, 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 I think you quoted him in your book. He tied the issue of usury to the risk of the person lending the money. In other words, if you're not taking risk and you're charging, to your point just a second ago, what would be considered confiscatory rates based on the risk you're taking, that is usury. In other words, there's no, there's no connection between the risk and the reward versus he talked about the risk. Um, it, it, it's strange that you know he was a Medici, he was corrupt, 
And yet he was very practical in his approach to the issue of usury. Well, I think, you know, there were biblical scholars who would look for loopholes and he had good lawyers and they were able to come up with this uh, solution. So at whatever Vatican council was at, they, they devised this idea that you're just talking about. Okay. If someone's, if someone might lose money, then it's okay. Uh, how, how much of the usury debate was actually just class warfare? Well, it certainly morphed into that. Um, there were you know, peasants who were in debt, who lost everything. And by, by rebelling against the rich, uh, you know, they, they were hoping that they could sponge their debts and, and maybe even you know, take power away from, from those you know, in charge. Uh, what, what made the book sort of interesting from a, uh, from a writing standpoint is I was able to follow this, this narrative arc beginning from when Fugger had nothing to the point where he became the richest person on earth to the point where he spent the latter part of his life having to defend it and he has to defend it against what was up to that point, the biggest mass revolutionary effort in the history of man, which was the German peasants revolt, which happened mm -hmm. right around the end of Fugger's lifetime. Um, the reason that this was a, uh, a large revolt rather than something that was just isolated to a single town, a single jurisdiction is, you know, we know about Gutenberg and the printing press, uh, because of the printing press, the ideas of Martin Luther were able to spread across Europe. Uh, the revolutionary ideas of Luther uh, provoked the peasants to rise up against the papacy and their allies, uh, number one being Fugger. So Fugger spent the last portion of his life, as mentioned, trying to hold on to his property in Hungary. Uh, Fugger actually had to uh, fortify his his home, his palace in Augsburg. Uh, Fugger controlled a few uh, little towns around Augsburg. The peasants marched on these towns, tried to take them over, but with uh, superior weaponry and uh, the ability to to bribe people to leave them alone, Fugger was able to hold off the peasants. But it got it got pretty dangerous for Fugger at the end there, but he did manage to survive. Greg, is it possible to make a, uh, a, a analogy between uh, uh, indulgences uh, as a way to find salvation and making ESG or climate oriented investments? Yeah. Well, yeah, well, but wait, 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 one, one was peasants getting salvation then. Today, it's wealthy people looking down on the rest of society for salvation today, some, some could argue. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of uh, signifying going on, right? So, yeah, sure. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's one of the, the things that really came home to me in this book is that technology changes, but human mm -hmm. nature doesn't change. And <laughs> the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they were, they were pragmatists, though. They found a common enemy. Teach our listeners about their common enemy. Well, Luther... Luther was concerned. He saw that he created a monster, and Luther wanted his own version of Reformation to mm -hmm. to come into to being. The peasants had even more radical ideas than Luther, and and there there were priests that had that had views that were even farther to the left than Luther's own. Uh, Luther wanted to make sure that is that Lutheranism prevailed rather than something even more radical. So Luther actually advocated uh, a military force against the peasants to put down those who weren't listening to him, but were listening to rival priests. Sure. So yeah, uh, Fugger and Luther were aligned uh, when the peasants' revolt you know, reached its height. Because of that, the peasants did fail. It was essentially a communist revolution that was going on in Germany, where Correct. the peasants wanted to to take all the assets of the state and all the rich people distributed amongst themselves and 
live happily ever after. Uh, yeah, Luther didn't want that to happen, and Fugger didn't want that to happen, and the Emperor didn't want that to happen. Because it because that'll always work out wonderfully well, um, as we all uh, can joke about. Um, let's see. This might be my favorite line from the book, so I have to mention this as kind of our last part. Um, so you did a wonderful job. So we go through the election of Maximilian as Holy Roman Emperor, and then it comes to the point of his son Charles. And, you know, he's going through this whole process with the electors and you're back to the, you know, you talked about the bit him up process that came with that. And uh, I think it was um, Maximilian told Charles, quote, if you wish to gain mankind, you must play at a high stake, end quote. Um, that is incredible line. I mean, you can just see that rolling right off the tongue of a movie. But it also spoke to how important Maximilian knew that the price of the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, was that you needed to pay. Yeah. He, it, but, but what's strange about that, being Holy Roman Empire really didn't do a lot for you. It was, uh, it was if, if you could get the people to believe that you were divine and had authority over everyone else on earth, then you could do something with it. But there was too much resistance to that. But to even get to step up and and try to make that argument require that you paid and paid and paid. Um, so despite all the sanctimonious talk, at the end of the day, everything came down to money. Let's see, Greg. There's things that we didn't talk about even in our notes here. I was looking back. We didn't talk about how King Francis pretty much ended Switzerland as a warring nation in your book, which I thought was a very interesting little tidbit, um, uh, which is why they only, you know, uh, and also some of the reasons why they guard the Vatican obviously came from Fugger. Originally, there's just really great storylines that are very uh, practical for today's society and how we look at things. Um, is there anything else that we didn't talk about that you do think needs to be mentioned about Fugger, his time, or what he saw? Well, you know, we mentioned double entry bookkeeping, but I think that it's it's kind of boring. But it, it was also fundamental to how Fugger was so successful in that, unlike the others who were trying to do the same thing that he did, he kept all he kept very good records. And mm -hmm. whether he was trading textiles or trading copper or silver or whatever, he created the first consolidated balance sheet for everything mm -hmm. he did. So he knew every day what his net worth was based on the values that were being paid for for his stuff uh, no one else was doing that and that gave fugger the the conviction to to loan if he was he knew how liquid he was at all times he knew how much in the black he was uh he knew how 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 uh levered he could be and so not only was it was he a great negotiator and understood you know the the power of engineering and political connections and all that but he also knew the numbers better than anyone else on earth uh and that's why we're able while i'm able to make the claim that fugger was the richest man who ever lived is because we know exactly how much money he had and if we take that that net worth figure from his financial statements at the time of the year that he died, and then adjust that up for inflation, but also do this calculation that uh, is the common way to judge relative wealth through the ages, which is divide the wealth of an individual by the prevailing GDP, you come up with the fact that Fugger in today's dollars would be worth uh, something like you know, 400 billion, I think. And that would put him atop Rockefeller uh, as the, the richest of all time. Well, yeah, as Buffett says, uh, we play a relative game to your point. Um, Greg, thank you so much for joining us again. For our listeners, if you want to think about the path to success and wealth and business and investing, uh, you need to go buy a copy of Greg's book, The Richest Man Who Ever Lived. Jacob Fugger explains the pragmatism and risk needed for the unknown future that we all must deal with. Um, he also teaches us about the legacy we can leave, as you learn from his uh, legacy to today, and the effect that we can have on the world, uh, to even to our discussion that we had uh, prior with you, Greg, on American Rascal. For our audience, if you have a great book that you'd like to recommend, like Greg's, email podcast at smeetcap.com. That's podcast at smeetcap.com. You can also send your suggestions to us on Twitter 
Our handle is at SmeetCap. Thank you for joining us for a Book With Legs podcast. We look forward to the next episode. Thank you for listening to A Book With Legs, a podcast brought to you by Smead Capital Management. The material provided in this podcast is for informational use only and should not be construed as investment advice. You can learn more about Smead Capital Management and its products at SmeadCap.com or by calling your financial advisor.